Hi all, my name is Elizabeth Truba and I am part of the clinical faculty here at ASU. I am here to talk to you a little bit about adults with neurogenic communication disorders. All right, so you should have a copy of the slides and I'm going to go through them with you today. Um, so welcome, welcome. My background is in adults with neurogenic communication disorders. Um, I worked in an inpatient hospital for about eight or nine years um, with some experience in an inpatient rehabilitation center, um, an outpatient center, skilled nursing facilities, and a little bit of home health. Um, and then I transitioned to um, ASU to start in this teaching role. So before we get started, I want you to just kind of think about if you have ever observed or participated in speech therapy with an adult. So it looks a little bit different um, than pediatric speech therapy, but honestly, there are a lot of similarities and you'll find that as we go through this lecture. So neurogenic communication disorders cover a lot of different things. Today, we will focus um, a little bit on aphasia and your um, assignment after this class does focus on two different aphasia treatment approaches. But neurogenic communication disorders also includes acquired apraxia, dysarthria, traumatic brain injury or other cognitive linguistic disorders, right hemisphere disorder, and even dementia. Okay, and then dementia is kind of a big umbrella that covers a few different topics as well. Um, it also is important to know or think about that a lot of these conditions can coexist. Um, they might happen at the same time, maybe after someone has a stroke, they might have aphasia, apraxia, and dysarthria, or after a head injury, they might have dysarthria and a cognitive linguistic disorder. So you might see a lot of them, or oftentimes you can see a lot of these things co-occurring. So to begin with thinking about just what a general therapy session looks like, um, again, very similar to what a pediatric session might look like, um, except you will usually be sitting like at a table, or if you're in an inpatient setting, you might be like at their bed with a bedside table, but typically that person is sitting next to you um, um, or across from you or something like that, depending on the situation. But you can start the session off with a hello, just kind of building conversation, building up some rapport. Um, and then the accommodation kind of part of that session is where you're kind of starting to just warm up. So you might do just an easier task, something that you know that your client can do that they'll feel confident in. And then you get to kind of more of the work where you're working on a lot of your treatment objectives. You might be doing harder or more complex tasks. And then I always kind of like to finish up with like kind of like a cool down or something again that they can get their confidence back, something that doesn't put as much cognitive fatigue on them, um, something that they can practice, maybe a skill that they're, you know, pretty close to learning or they're pretty close to independent at that they can practice again. Um, and again, just feel that confidence and be kind of error free in that. And then wrapping up conversation about homework or home exercise program. And then um, I usually like to reinforce when the next session is. Considerations about professionalism. So I think sometimes if you haven't worked with an adult before, I think that's what people are kind of most nervous about, right? They're like, well, I can work with kids. I can play. I know how to talk to kids. Um, but sometimes with adults, there can be a, a sense of kind of nervousness or like a sense of, um, I don't know, kind of intimidation almost might be the right word. Um, but it's really not bad. It's fine. I love it. Um, by the way, so a couple considerations that you can think about. Voice, you want your voice to be strong and confident. Um, language, you really want to be using direct and respectful language. Um, sometimes indirect language can be confusing to someone who has a language disorder like aphasia or someone that has a brain injury. Um, so if you're using a lot of like metaphors or you're kind of speaking around topics and you're not telling them exactly what you're going to do that day or exactly what your expectations are, um, a lot of information can get kind of lost in the message there. Um, and then also thinking about our clients who are from different backgrounds. So maybe a different cultural background, a different linguistic background, using indirect language can be really confusing. Um, and we want to be clear, direct, um, and, and kind of remove, the way I think of it is we want to remove as much of the cognitive fatigue as possible because their therapy session is really gonna tax their brain. So we wanna make the other stuff, like the introductions and the instructions as easy as possible. Um, intonation, and this kind of goes along with voice, but you wanna you know, really just avoid using like playful or childlike intonation and behaviors. Um, you know, if somebody does something right, like clapping or you know, really big exaggerated 
you know, thumbs up or big smiles or, you know, and not like you can't smile with an adult, you absolutely can, but just the way that you're portraying that. Um, I think a lot of times when we're giving praise, I think that's the thing that I noticed most. And the thing I had the hardest time with after working with kids for so long in an adult session, you know, you want to get that big, like, oh yeah, great job or yay, or you cannot do that in an adult session. Um, uh, most of the time they, they're not going to like that. Um, so think of it just as if you were to be getting speech therapy yourself, or if you were giving speech therapy to a peer or a family member, you know, you want to just keep it how you would talk to an adult, not really sing songy or anything like that. All right. So with your wording, um, and that kind of goes with intonation too, actually, now that I'm reading that, but instead of like, we're going to go play a game, you know, something like very, very clear and direct, we're going to practice talking in full sentences. Again, direct, clear, they know exactly what to expect from you. And it's not, I, I don't tend to like calling therapy activities games with adults um, because they, yeah, a lot of times they just don't, they don't tend to like that. Um, okay, so, and then with your rate, you're going to use a nice slow and steady rate of speech, use a nice calm pace and allow for moments of silence. I think this is the hardest part. But sometimes your people, your clients might just need a little bit of extra processing time. Even if they don't have like a big glaring cognitive deficit, the processing time for language and cognition might be more. So if you ask a question and they don't respond right away, sometimes we get uncomfortable with the silence. So we ask it again, or we pop in with our own answer, or we start with a cue. Just wait, just in your head, count to five, slowly, five Mississippis, 10 Mississippis and give them the time to process. And then if they do need the help or they do need to, you to repeat the question, absolutely. But just make sure you're going at like a just a slow, steady pace, give them time, give them space. All right, and then personal wise, so obviously while keeping it professional, but you really want to get to know your client. Um, so the more that you know about them, um, about their life, about where they work or where they worked before, about their hobbies, about their interests, about what languages they like, about what foods they like to eat. All of that stuff is great information to help guide your sessions because we want our therapy material to be functional, things that they're interested in, things that they're engaged in. So if you're copying pages out of a workbook that's just made for any old person, your client probably isn't going to be that engaged. So the more that you professionally get to know them, the better you can make your therapy sessions. So that leads us into our next, um, our next slide here. But when you're conducting the, the therapy session, really, you know, the activities that you're using to target your goals, they should be varied. They should be functional. They should be engaging. So if you feel bored in that therapy session, like, oh, here we go, saying another sentence, going through another word, they're probably bored too. So prepare a lot of stuff, you know, prepare multiple activities per goal. Um, you know, and again, having those functional activities. So if you know that they are an accountant and they're a very analytical thinker, or they work with numbers a lot, or, you know, then maybe your activity that day is going to be using like a restaurant menu to calculate up totals of everybody's order at the restaurant, or you can pull up a fake gas bill or your own water bill or something from home. Um, and you know, they're maybe having to calculate like a balance and how much is due and how much is owed and, you know, all of these different things, but functional things that they can do. Um, and yeah, what, what do they do in their daily life? Um, again, like thinking about hobbies too, can be interesting. Maybe there's someone that likes to garden. So that day you pick words that they would use out in the garden, or they're having a hard time, uh, telling their partner what they need at home while they're getting ready. Well, great. Let's start talking about items in the bathroom, items in the kitchen, um, all those things. So, you know, really just think about kind of fun activities that you can do with them um, and really having that connection of explaining how they will use that in their daily life can be really helpful. And you're also going to provide a lot of models, right? So show them exactly what you want, tell them exactly what you want them to do. Um, so they're really understanding the purpose and the why you'll get a lot more um, buy-in for that. For reinforcement with adults, so we're going to want to acknowledge and praise correct production. Um, a lot of adult therapy and a lot of um, other speech therapy in general, um, you know, we want to use that errorless learning. So we don't want our, our person, our adult to be 
making the same error multiple times because then they're kind of starting to learn that. And you'll see errorless learning a lot in um, speech therapy with people with dementia specifically. Um, but I think it does carry over well to people with aphasia and brain injuries too. But anyway, so you want to really reinforce those product correct productions. Um, you can acknowledge their incorrect productions, but we don't want to dwell on it or praise it or, you know, any of that. Um, so you can acknowledge and praise their effort, but, you know, get them, get them to the correct production as quick as you can. Um, and I think sometimes we feel, especially if you're a younger clinician, you might feel a little awkward or uncomfortable correcting an adult or correcting someone that's older than you or um, something like that. But really, you know, just think about and understand that they're in speech therapy because you're the expert, right? They want to learn from you um, and they want you to tell them, you know, to help correct them because in, in regular life, a lot of people won't do that. So you're, it's okay for you to correct them because you'll do it in a professional way. Um, reinforcing strategy use is really important. So especially um, in people with a traumatic brain injury, sometimes we might not get all of the cognitive skills back, but what speech therapy is about is teaching them strategies that they can use. So maybe their short-term memory isn't as great as it was before their injury, but we're showing them memory strategies that they can use in their daily life. And we want to practice the use of those strategies in our therapy sessions. Um, and when they're using the strategies independently or they're using them correctly, awesome. We want to really um, acknowledge that and praise that so they continue to do that at home. Um, and same when they're recognizing their errors. So if that client is recognizing that they didn't say something correctly or do something correctly, that's great that they're recognizing that because we're going to start to build their self-advocacy, right? We want them, if they can start to recognize and note the errors that they're making, then they can start working on correcting them or they can start working on strategies to get around them. So we really want to cultivate that skill in our clients. Um, so, and again, you know, using that silence or using those pauses can be really helpful because you're giving your client the chance to really think about what they said, think about, okay, is that right? You're like, am I confident about that? Wait, did that come out wrong? And giving them the chance to think about it and correct it on their own if they can, if they're at that point. All right. So another thing to keep in mind is just not rushing through the session. So I think oftentimes in the beginning, clinicians ask, you know, you ask the client to do something, you document if they got it right or wrong, and then you just move on because you have all these things you want to do, or you want to get through all these goals or all these tasks, but really just slow it down. Right. So you can just try to shape unsuccessful productions. Um, so maybe they get it wrong. You don't have to just mark it wrong and move on stay there for a minute, you know, work on that. You could maybe work on that target for a while, depending on what your client's needs are. Um, but yeah, you, you might not make it through all of your material every single session and that's okay. You'll get a sense of what your client needs. If they need more time or less time on a specific target or on a specific activity. Um, but you can, you can kind of stay in those spots to shape things, to help them, to cue them, to give them reinforcement and repetition. Um, because repetition is really going to facilitate learning in the long run. So we really want to use that to our advantage. Um, and then another point just from this slide is just focusing on what they do that helps and what they do that doesn't help. So sometimes as speech um, therapists too, we can give them a strategy. Maybe it's something that has worked well for yourself, that has worked well for other clients. And then you're seeing your client in the session do it and it's hard for them or it's cumbersome or it's not something that they like to do. Um, so you can scrap it, but you have to kind of watch them do it. So maybe they're, maybe, yeah, you watch them do a strategy or they're, you have them using like a paper notebook or something or to write things down, but writing is very difficult for them. So you see them struggling with that and getting frustrated. Let's skip writing. And, and you can say that, you know what? I wanted us to try writing because I thought it would help X, Y, Z. I think it's, I think it's, I don't think it's working. Let's try this instead let's try these pictures or let's, you know, you can, you can easily kind of move and manipulate. Um, so then you can just, yeah, try different strategies, try different things to see what's best for them and keeping them informed about your observations the whole way through. Task complexity during sessions is also important. Um, not all similar tasks are alike. So just in one little category, you can create a lot of variation. So you could have a one-step command. So that's something that you might be using with someone with expressive aphasia. 
but a one-step command can be really easy or a one-step command could be more complex or abstract. So like a simple one-step command, touch your nose. That's something simple. It's something egocentric, your nose, something that they can maybe put that together a little easier versus put the pen on the paper. I'm still telling them one thing to do, but now they have to figure out what's the pen, what's the paper it's going on. Okay, so, you know, one step, but very different. Touch your nose, put the pen on the paper. So kind of be thinking about that, you know, depending on maybe your client is working on one-step commands. Do you want it to be simple one-step commands, complex? How, you know, how are you using that hierarchy to get there? Um, and same with a one-syllable word, you know, you might have something like uh, bop versus something like got, you know, depending on, you know, where the sounds are or like, can you model the sound for them or show them the sound? One-syllable words aren't going to all look the same. Um, so be thinking about that hierarchy of difficult within your tasks. You will probably have to go kind of like up and down in difficulty level during different activities. And your ability to do this really makes you a strong clinician because again, you're you're using that intuition. You're watching, you're taking the data. They're struggling, struggling, struggling. Maybe I need to make this a little easier or they're getting really frustrated and you can tell that they're mad because they keep getting them wrong. Then let's bring it back. Let's do a couple simple ones in a row. So they're getting that feeling of success and they're feeling good about using a strategy or feeling good about what they can do and then eat, take it up a notch and make it a little harder. So you kind of get the feel for that once you get to know your client better and once you are just working with them longer. Taking data is also very important. So you don't want to forget to take data, but you really have to track in a way that's meaningful for you. So again, this is something that's kind of trial and error, right? So you might, you know, figure out a system for you, whether it's check marks or circles or stars, or maybe you make a table before your session, or maybe you just like to scribble it out on a piece of paper. Maybe you're at a facility where they want you to chart in the room in the moment. So you can just document right on the computer. You'll have to kind of find a way that's efficient for you and that's meaningful for you. So when you look back at that data, it makes sense. And you can try all those different methods until you find something that really clicks for you. Um, and I think the best way to do this too, when you're working at a new facility, is observing other people and asking other people, you know, how do you do this? How do you take efficient data? And a lot of times therapists, even physical and occupational therapists are happy to share how they, how they do things um, to make it easier for you. Um, and then you want to keep track of what type of cueing you're providing too. That's also a part of data. So are you, you know, they're getting it right or wrong, but also did you have to cue them? Did you cue them once or twice or three times? Was your cue just a small reminder or did you have to do some kind of like hand over hand, really, really assist them, like giving them the word syllable by syllable or something? So be, you know, be thinking about, was it a verbal cue? Was it a visual cue? Was it a lot of repetitive cues? Was it just one? Um, Cause that, that will help you track their progress as well. Um, graphing data can be really helpful too, especially as a newer clinician, because you, it really like helps you see just see your data in a bigger picture. I think this can also be really helpful for our clients if you put it on paper like that. So again, maybe if they are frustrated um, with their current condition, but you can actually show them like, look at, look at all the things that you have done or look at, you know, look at the success that you've had. Look at this, you've got, you know, from here to here. So it, it can just be a nice way to clean up your data and make it visually uh, make sense. Home practice is also really important. So we want to encourage um, self-monitoring. So again, like we talked about before, that's good because we want to make our patients advocates, self-advocates, so they can start to notice what's going well, what's not going well. Did I make an error? Do I need to correct myself? Um, but you can do that by asking them questions. So maybe after a, an activity or something, you know, how'd that go for you? Um, do you want to try that again? Do you want to move on to something else? Um, even asking them to like, okay, what is it that we're working on this session? Or what is our goal this session um, can be really helpful as well. Um, just to check in to make sure that they're still understanding, like that you're both on the same page for what the goal is, what the task is, is working on. Um, emphasizing rich communication opportunities outside of the therapy room is great. So encouraging them to have functional conversations, um, home practice is really helpful if you can just make it fit into their daily routine. 
um, things that they can practice by themselves. So they don't need a caregiver to sit and help them, you know, with a worksheet um, because their caregivers have a lot to do as well. Um, so if it's something that they can, if they can write, you know, can they practice writing a list of words on their own or practice sentence writing or can they call a friend on their own to talk to someone or catch up? Can they call their pharmacy and ask a question? You know, um, can you go and talk to your neighbor once before I see you again? Things like that. And then asking them again when they come into the next session, how did the home practice go? What did you do this week? Tell me about it. You know, and if they're like, yeah, I did. I I talked to my neighbor last week. It was hard, but I had my script and I was ready to go. Awesome. You know, that's, you know, highlight that. Um acknowledge that and really praise them for that. The home practice is very important though. All right. So aphasia, again, I said we were going to talk about aphasia quite a bit today. Um, so symptoms of aphasia, um, it's kind of split into two, right? So we have like receptive skills, where, which is how we are understanding language. Um, so like this one that says trouble understanding written words or trouble understanding speech, like how well you're comprehending what you're, what you're taking in and then expressive, um, language would be like when they're having trouble speaking clearly, having trouble writing clearly, trouble remembering, accessing the right words, remembering the names of words, things like that. And people can have difficulty with one or the other or both. Um, so then this is just a little, a chart of um, different types of aphasia. So, you know, these are the different types of aphasia across here. Broca's, you know, if you have aphasia in the Broca's area, Wernicke's aphasia, transcortical motor. And then this chart here kind of shows what someone with that type of aphasia would typically have trouble with. So the check mark is something that like, you know, for someone with Broca's aphasia, usually their comprehension is intact, but their fluency and their repetition is not. Those are the areas that are impaired. So this can be kind of a quick like cheat sheet just to be thinking about um, different aphasia types. Aphasia can also be split into fluent aphasias and non-fluent aphasias, which are kind of talked about over here. So a fluent aphasia might have impaired comprehension, a normal rate of speech, but they're using a lot of neologisms, paraphasias, anomia, perseveration. We'll talk about those on the next couple slides. So they might sound like you or I, but the actual content of their speech isn't necessarily rich or it doesn't necessarily make sense because uh, they're coming up with false words or fake words. Um, someone who has non-fluent aphasia, their comprehension varies. It might be impaired. It might be intact, um, but they're going to have reduced vocabulary. They might sound kind of telegraphic. They're having a lot of trouble finding the right words. So when they start talking, it doesn't sound like you or I. It's very disrupted or interrupted. The rate is off. The prosody is off. So the next couple of slides, we'll talk about some of those different areas too. So someone with aphasia might have difficulty with grammar. So they might be making morphosyntactic errors. So errors with number, with tense, with gender, with possessives. Um, a lot of times they're going to do a substitution, but not necessarily omit it altogether. Um, paraphasias, and we'll, I have a, the next slide kind of shows this um, a little bit better too. But a paraphasia is a use of an, a non-intended word. So someone's trying to say boy, but they say girl. They're trying to say train, but they say bus. Um, it could be more of a phonemic paraphasia. So they're saying snowst instead of ghost or lat instead of cat. Um, and it might be something that's mixed. So maybe they're they're mixing semantic use, they're mixing phonemic use, and you know, they're trying to say late and it comes out fast, then it comes out last, but they're still not quite getting to the word that they want, the intended word. A neologism is a new made up word. So the example here, oh, that's a boy, a mioi. He's a flinder. He's flample. Cookies, his pinchers, a uh, haveness. Is that right? So they're coming up with these mioi and flinder and flample. None of those words actually have meaning, but those are the words that are kind of coming out of their mouth. So they're making it up. Um, and sometimes the person might have knowledge of that or not. They might still think that the word coming out is the correct word. And their listener is like, what are you talking about? They don't understand it. And that can be very frustrating for the person with aphasia because they're like, I just said it, a flinder. And they're like, I don't know what a flinder is. But that person thinks that they're saying, you know, uh, whatever word it is that they're actually looking for. 
like boy, you know, maybe in that, in that example, they were looking for boy, but they said flinder. All right. So this is the, like the little kind of chart thing of a paraphasia. So like a paraphasia for cat, if that paraphasia is, if that person is having a lexical paraphasia, the word cat, if it's a semantic, so this is kind of breaking it down. So it could be, if it's lexical, it could be semantic, mixed, unrelated, or formal. So those are the words that might come out instead of cat. And then if it's a sublexical paraphasia, that would be more of the phonemic or a neologism. So something like lat or soft could come out. So that might help you look at it a little bit better. Um, anomia is difficulty with word retrieval. So trying to find the word for it, I can't find it. I can't think of the word for that. Um, agrammatism. So kind of, I know we talked about grammar um, a couple slides ago, but you know, difficulty using, it could be difficulty using or understanding grammar. So omitting function words, um, mother washing dishes, water flows sink, but there's no like connecting or function words in between that sentence. Um, it could be an inflection omission. The mother is wash the dish, water flow from the sink. Um, a lot of times agrammatism coincides with reduced output. So that person doesn't really talk or express as much. Um, and then these sentences, I don't think I have it on these slides, but there's um, a famous picture in the speech world, but it's called the cookie theft picture. And a lot of times people working with people, clinicians working with people with aphasia or even research, they use the cookie theft photo um, just to get, and they tell the person like, describe this picture. And it's a picture of a woman at the sink and the sink is overflowing. She's washing dishes and the kids are like trying to get into the cookie jar and they're about to fall off a stool. And so there's a lot going on in the picture, but you would give that picture to someone with aphasia and just see what they come up with. So some of these examples are from looking at that picture. Um, circumlocution is something that's also seen to someone who's kind of working toward the word, you know, they're going all around it, but they can't, they just can't quite get to it. So it's a raft, graft, no, bit, yellow, long necked animal, long necker, spots, skinny, legs, eats from trees. Oh, I know it. Africa, giraffe, that's it. You know, so they're working all around it. They're telling you things about it, but it takes them a minute to get to the actual target word. Other errors that you might see in someone with aphasia, um, you know, a recurrent or stereotypic utterance. So, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And they're, they're repeating that nonstop. Or, you know, how are you? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, I said, I said, I said. Um, it might be an impairment with repetition. So when you're telling them, like, repeat this back to me. The cat jumped over the moon. Isn't it supposed to be a cow? Anyway, but they can't, they can't repeat that back. So they might say the cat. They might say uh, moon, they might not say anything, um, but it, it usually gets worse the longer length of what you want them to repeat. Uh, perseveration is something that can also happen in someone with aphasia. So there it's like a repetition or like an intrusion of a previous item. So cow, it's a cow, cow, this one's a cow. And then the clinician, you know, that's like maybe the clinician showed them a picture of the cow and then they show them a picture of a cat, but that person is still saying cow because they can't quite get off of that previous, that previous picture. They're still kind of stuck or they're perseverating on that word. Uh, and perseveration sometimes can be linked to impulsiveness as well. All right. So semantic feature analysis, this is important because you will use it in your assignment today. Um, but this is a type of aphasia treatment, and it can also be used as a strategy, a communication strategy to find the right word. Um, so there's a target picture or a target item, right? And we'll practice this on a couple slides. And what that person is supposed to do is come up, like basically fill in all of these blank boxes. So you have the target picture and then you're, you have to figure out what group it's in, what use it has, the action it makes, the properties, the location and the association. So we'll do this together on the next one. Um, so this, if, here's an example. Um, so if we were together in class, we would do this, but I want you to just take a second to think about this. So think about like what group this is in. So we know it's a fork, right? But that person can't say fork or the point of semantic feature analysis is that we're trying to come up with all of these six things over here on the side. So what group does this fit into? It's a utensil. What use does it have? It's used for eating. 
It's used for poking a piece of food and bringing it to your mouth. There's not necessarily a right answer for any of these. Um, so you're not usually looking for a specific thing, but they should be in a, you know, there's, there's multiple right answers, I guess. Um, and then the action. So what does it do? Okay. It, and that kind of also overlaps with use a little bit, right? So maybe for use, you could say it's used for eating action. It pokes a piece of food to bring it to your mouth properties. It has a long handle and pokey parts on the other end. Location, this is usually found in the kitchen or at a restaurant on your table. Association, it reminds me of, I was going to say pitchfork, but that's actually using the word. Um, it reminds me of kind of like a spoon. It kind of, you know, it could be associated with a spoon or a knife maybe. So that's how semantic feature analysis goes. Not all of these things will work for every item. So there might be some, or we can see in the case of the fork, use and action were fairly similar. So if you're using this with a client, they don't always have to like check every single box, but maybe if you have your client, so I might say like, okay, so we're looking at fork, we're trying to get to this. Let's fill in at least three of these on the side. So it's a utensil, it's found on a table, it pokes the food and brings it to my mouth. And that could be enough. You don't necessarily need to do all six. So we're gonna try another picture on the next page. So different, think about that. What group is this in? It's a food, it's used to nourish my body, to give me energy, to feed, to feed me. It, again, use and action are pretty similar there. Um, it has, in this case, it has a hard shell and it has things on the inside. There's meat and vegetables inside. Locations, it's found on the table. It's found in my kitchen. It's found at a restaurant. It, they could even be more specific. It's found at a Mexican restaurant. Uh, it reminds me of a tostada. I don't know. Uh, it reminds me of... I don't know what's your you could associate it with just like another food uh it's not really like a burrito anyhow so you could fill in those and then the next one we'll practice again so be thinking about how you would describe this using semantic feature analysis And then these are getting a little bit trickier, right? So this one's getting a little bit trickier because what are we talking about specifically? The occupation, the actual person. There's a little more variability in this picture, I think. And then my last example here, try that one. What group, what use, what action? What properties? So of those four, and I know we kind of went quick through the last two, but which one was most difficult to describe? So in that case, just like I would do in a therapy session, we went from easiest to hardest, right? So describing a fork was pretty simple, right? That's pretty straightforward. It's one item, can't be mistaken for anything else. Taco could be a little harder, right? Somebody, people might have a different expectation of a taco. They might make them. They might only go to a restaurant for them. Maybe they're from somewhere that doesn't eat tacos. So you might have a little more variability there. And then the next one I think is a little bit harder because again, you're talking about an occupation. Um, you know, might, yeah, might be a little bit trickier. You find this person in the kitchen. It's a job. Um, I guess that's not too hard. This last one though, it gets a little bit more abstract, right? So are they, does she want me to say restaurant? Does she want me to say eating? Does she want me to say dinner? Does she want me to say waiter, server, conversation, social? You know, there's a lot of different places you could go with this picture. It's not as concrete as a fork. So keep that in mind. Um, when you're doing semantic feature analysis, um, you wanna be thinking about that. So kind of jumping to the second part here, but what level of difficulty um, can your client handle? What are they up for? 
Um, so I took a couple of my pictures out from previous slides, but again, simple versus complex, a fork versus a restaurant. That's a lot different. Um, if they are, can describe like something like a noun, like a taco versus maybe a concept or an action like voting or eating in a restaurant. Um, and then also something, whether your item is common or rare, if you have a picture of dog versus a picture of a sloth, many times that person has probably seen a dog a lot more than they've seen a sloth, depending on where they live and where they're from. Um, so be thinking about the level of difficulty when you're, when you're coming up with semantic feature analysis items. Um, and then be thinking about, does your client kind of popping back up, sorry to go backwards here to the first point. Does your client do well with words within the same topic? So would they like to do a fork, a taco, a chef, a restaurant, kind of all in the same category? Or is that going to make them kind of get stuck? Because, you know, if you picked like all foods, is that going to be too hard where it's like to go from a taco to a sandwich, to a banana, to a cake? Is it too like kind of grouped together in their brain too much where they get kind of stuck and it's hard for them to get to another food? So maybe they need something like they need to see a taco, they need to see a pencil, they need to see a car, they need to see a beach, things that are not as related. So they get kind of a fresh start and they're not so likely to perseverate on previous items. Um, and then that takes us down to the last point here. So if someone is perseverating, are they, you know, are they stuck? What can you do? Um, switch, switch the modality. So maybe switch the presentation of the target. So maybe you have, you're showing them pictures that you have printed, or you're showing them pictures up on your computer screen and they're really stuck with that. Well, are they in person with you? Can you get the actual item? So maybe you can just get some items from around your office and show them picture frames, show them a pencil, show them chapstick, you know, something that where they can actually pick it up and hold it and touch it and feel it versus just looking at a picture. You might get a different reaction. Um, an item that's their own, like this is my a picture of my own armchair that I sit in every single night or this is a picture of a fancy modern armchair that we found on Google image that doesn't look like theirs, that doesn't spark those thoughts as quick. Um, so be thinking about that, how you're presenting your target can be important and their communication method. So maybe the verbal response is too hard. Can they write it for you? Could you have the pictures laid out where they can just point to a picture or they can pick out of a field of three pictures? Um, so again, thinking about their level, what they're at, and how you can successfully get them to what you want them to do is important. Uh, maybe they need extra time, again, allowing for that silence, allowing for that increased thought processing, um, or even a break. So maybe we do one for semantic feature analysis, and then we take a break and we watch a quick video, or we take a sip of our coffee, or you know whatever it is to just kind of like unfocus on what they're doing and try something else, or and you know and then come back to the next to the next task. Um, and then again, thinking about your target words too. So again, thinking about cultural backgrounds, linguistic backgrounds, maybe you're giving someone a picture of something that they're not familiar with or something that is not functional for them or is not a word that they know. Um, you need to really be cognizant of that. So you're not, you know, you're kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt and we're setting them up for success. So script training, this is the other thing that you'll need for your assignment today, but script training is a predictable sequence of phrases or sentences that can be rehearsed. So it could be a monologue. So you could have your person practice a script of like their personal introduction. Hi, my name is Liz. I'm a speech language pathologist and I work at ASU. And I'm going to practice that over and over and over. So when I meet someone, I can go straight to my script. Um, an explanation of deficits. I had a stroke and I have aphasia. I need more time and having them practice that, um, a special interest, maybe they're into golf or they're into sewing or, you know, have them practice a couple sentences about that. Um, a script could also be to be used with a communication partner. So how do you do when you meet someone? Like I say, hello, they say, hello, how are you? I'm fine. I'm good. You know? And so it could be something going back and forth, what you do when you meet someone, how you order food at a restaurant, how you ask for help. Um, script training, we want to make functional. So something that they would use, um, and it should be something for a recurring communication situation, um, or it can be so recurring. So again, like a, an introduction is something you might have to do more than once. 
And it can also be a topic important to the client. So maybe they have a big speech coming up or they have a big presentation or they have um, a family reunion coming up where they're going to have to have the same types of exchange with somebody for an important event. Those are all good times to use a script. So how do you do script training? It can be um, blocked practice where they have, you know, you have multiple scripts or multiple kind of back and forth. Um, you're going to train one phrase or one sentence at a time. You have that cueing hierarchy, you know, so you're going to maybe help them a lot in the beginning, drop back your cues, drop back your cues until they can independently do it. You're giving them feedback throughout the whole process. Um, and then after that, so the random practice starts after the accuracy of blocked practice is achieved. So they've got it, they can do it, they're doing it more independently, they're ready. So now you can kind of move to the random practice. So now maybe you have each of the scripts on like a different note card. Maybe you're going to like random select, random select a cue card and the client has to start from wherever that cue card you're starting. So maybe you're actually starting on like the third step of that script, but they have to know the script so well that they can pick up from there. And then you're giving them feedback at the end. Another method you could do is just structuring the conversation. So the clinician is starting it again at random. So, and then the, the clinician, again, then the client has to complete the script, just like in that first one, kind of from where the clinician is starting off, right? Because we know that in, in real life, a conversation isn't going to go exactly how you prepare in the therapy room. So we want to be giving them enough space so they can kind of accommodate for that when they're out of the therapy room. So they're kind of ready for variability. All right, so other aphasia models, and we can't go through them today because I've already talked long enough, um, but for the most part, aphasia models, they're going to be like treatment models. They're going to be individualized based on the deficit severity and the type of aphasia they have. So common elements of aphasia models are they all promote communication. Okay, so some that you might see often, um, PACE, promoting aphasic communication effectiveness, melodic intonation therapy response elaboration training. There's lots and lots of them. So I would suggest you go to the ASHA practice portal or look up in one of your books, but you'll see lots and lots of different aphasia treatment models. Um, they also all typically have, you know, you want, you're wanting to use a systematic measurement. So you're going to have a long-term goal. You're going to have short-term goals. You're, you know, you're going to, you, you know what you're working towards. And the overall function is that we want it to generalize to conversation. So we want that person to be in a communication group. We want them to, you know, communicate with their family, communicate with their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers, whoever it is. That's the goal, right? Usually they want to get back to social socialization or conversation. So your goals, you want that to be like a do, right? So a measurable action that the client will do. So they will point, they will name, they will fill in but try not to do things that you can't really measure. So like they will understand when I ask them a question. Nah, that's gonna be hard for you to measure because how do you know if they understand? You know, they might be giving you a head nod or a, or a shake or whatever it is, but it might not be consistent with aphasia depending on their deficit. So just make sure you have a very clear measurable action. Um, and then you'll have the condition in your goal. So that level of support, the level of linguistic complexity, the environment, all of that stuff. So. This condition is what you can manipulate as they improve. So maybe you start your goal at the syllable level in a structured task with moderate cues, and then they meet that. So now it's like, okay, let's try word level in a structured task with moderate cues. Great. They got that too. Let's try word level in conversation with moderate cues or with, so, you know, these are the things that you can manipulate to change their goals and make them a little bit harder as they improve. And then you'll want a criteria. So you want some sort of accuracy level or something that you know that they've met the goal. So usually it will be, you know, like a percentage of something or, you know, 80% of the time or three times out of five or whatever it is, something that's easy to measure, but also something that's capable of capturing change and progress. And then you'll also want to know how many times you want to see that. So it can't just be like, oh, they name five items in the kitchen one time, or, you know, that's not a great goal, right? So we want to, like, we know it's something that they can do. They can do it multiple times. So we know that they truly learned it and they're ready to go to the next step. So you want to have a clear criteria. 
So group therapy, I wanted to touch on real quick, because this can be really important for aphasia and also for traumatic brain injury, really anyone with a communication disorder. Um, but group therapy is awesome. And university clinics are lucky enough to be able to offer this most times. Not all private practice clinics can, um, but groups are great because that person can work on topic maintenance, on turn-taking, balanced participation. It's all client-centered. Um, they can share advice. They can share experiences, things that the clinician might not truly understand. Um, and it really works on caregiver support too, which is really, really important. We want our caregivers to be strong and happy and healthy so they can be the best caregivers to our clients. So quick, quick, quick too, because we're wrapping up here. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the other neurogenic communication disorders. Um, so apraxia, that person is having difficulty initiating, executing movement patterns. They're going to have inconsistent errors. So a speech therapist's role in this is helping the client relearn those motor sequences um, and you'll increase in complexity. A lot of work with apraxia is repetitive. It's very intensive. It can be intensive drill work, visual, a lot of times tactile support can be helpful. Um, and if you can get your client to self-monitor, again, just like we talked about previously, that can be great. And as early as possible, you want to be using functional and useful words. So they're practicing those words for their speech from an early stage. Uh, dysarthria. So dysarthria, you know, there's a lot of different types of dysarthria. So they're all going to um, look and appear a lot differently depending on the person, depending on the type of dysarthria, depending on the severity but we're typically working on increasing intelligibility. Um, our intelligibility is, you know, um, influenced by a lot of different things, by all these different subsystems. So we're working on respiration, on phonation, on resonance, on articulation. We're working on rate and intonation and pitch. There's a lot of different things that can make someone's intelligibility better. And it'll depend on what, what your client needs. Um, and to work on accuracy, you know, you can work on different voice and place and manner. Um, there's a lot of really good um, therapeutic programs in place too that can target dysarthria really well. Um, and then for traumatic brain injury and cognitive linguistic disorders, you really want to utilize um, utilize that person's current skills. Really, I kind of mentioned this before, but you're really working a lot I think a lot of times with TBI therapy, you're working on compensatory strategies. So maybe that memory isn't as great as it was before. That's okay. What kind of strategies and things can we do? What ways can we modify the environment to support that person? Even if they still have some memory difficulty, how can we compensate for that? Um, and skilled therapy can work on different things. Skilled therapy can work on attention, can work on thought formulation and processing executive functioning can be a really, really big deal here. Um, so having that person work on planning and initiating self-monitoring, um, and then working on reasoning, decision-making, problem solving, all of that, um, is usually a part of therapy with someone who has a cognitive linguistic disorder, right? Hemisphere disorder. Um, a lot of times you're kind of working on, so somebody with a right hemisphere disorder might have left neglect. So we can work on that in therapy. Um, in a way that's, that makes sense for a speech therapist. Um, like maybe like when they're reading, um, or eating, if you're doing swallowing therapy, um, prosody can also be, um, a deficit in this group. So that's something else that we might work on, um, with these people. And we're working on attention, perception, discourse. There's a lot of research on discourse in people with right hemisphere disorders, um, and ways that speech therapists can work on that. Um, abstract reasoning. A lot of times that um, you know, humor and sarcasm and inferencing and metaphors and ambiguous meanings, all of that can be really tough for someone that has um, right hemisphere brain damage. So that's another thing that we can work on in therapy. Um, yeah, gosh, I feel like there, there's so much, we could have a couple more hours of this. I know you don't want that, but we could. Um, and then the last quick topic I'll talk about, or the last kind of air, big area in neurogenic communication disorders is dementia. Um, and people, speech pathologists can work on people who have dementia. We're compensating for that cognitive linguistic decline. We can't make it better, but we can try to, again, compensate, help that person be safe, help them hang on to all of the skills that they have before they lose more. Um, caregiver training is huge for this population. Um, 
you know, changing up the environment, putting up places for visual reminders, getting better organization systems set up, getting safety mechanisms in place. Um, so those are kind of environmental changes that can make it a safer place for that person with dementia. Um, and then again, that compensation. So we can work to compensate for changes in cognition and changes in language. And we really want to work on those like daily activities, getting dressed, taking a bath, eating, you know, making sure that person feels safe um, and they have the communication skills they need to thrive in those places. All right. So I am going to go to your assignment real quick because I did want to talk to you about this. So you have an assignment for this class and you are going to work in your group to respond to the following case studies. Okay, so I think I can come in here. So your first case, this one's going to be the one about semantic feature analysis. So kind of think back or rewind back um, to that part of the lecture. But you have a 42-year-old man who suffered a stroke and he has aphasia. So the SLP has established goals for picture naming common objects by having the client use semantic feature analysis. So now it's talking about, it gives you kind of an example. So the first thing that the clinician does is a pencil, then the clinician shows him paper. Um, but when you move to paper, that person is saying pencil still. So what I want you to do for this assignment is list five things that you could do to help them perseverate less during this naming task. So they're having a hard time moving from pencil to paper. So what are five things that you could change to help your client not perseverate, not get stuck on that first item? And then I want you to list five words that you could use as target. So maybe we're planning his next session. And now I want you to think of, okay, what other words could we use instead? So that time we used, you know, paper, pencil, what could you do for your next session? So do you, you know, and then I want you to explain to me why you picked them, what order you would present them in, and then what instructions you want the client to do while naming the target items. So again, be thinking about how we talked about complexity. Do you want to start really hard? Do you want to start really easy? Do you want all of your items to be in the same category? Do you want them to be different? Should we give this gentleman something complex, abstract, a mix of both? So those are the things I want you to think about as you come up with the five words that you're going to use with him in the next session. Okay. And explain that out. So that's your first case. And then the second case, um, we are working with a 55 year old woman who suffered from a stroke. She has aphasia and dysarthria. So this is kind of telling you a little bit more about her. She came to group um, and she wanted to tell the group that her daughter is getting married in six weeks. She's going to be meeting the parents of her daughter's fiance during the first for the first time. She wants to be able to introduce herself, explain her difficulties and welcome them to the family. She's pretty nervous. So what therapy method could we use? Think about one of the ones that we just talked about. What would we use? And then describe step-by-step -step how you would use that to help her reach her goal. So think about that. Okay. So how, how would you go about helping her prepare for that? Okay. If you have any questions, email me. You can also ask um, Dr. Brown. Um, but this is my email address on here. If anyone uses Slack, I'm also on Slack, um, but you can email me any questions that you have about adult neurogenics. You can email me about aphasia. You can email me about your time here at ASU, whatever you want. Um, anyway, thank you so much for listening to me today um, and for being here. I hope you have a great rest of the day or evening whenever you're listening to this. Good luck on your assignment and that's it. Go Devils.